welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 9 of the Madden America podcast. This week we interview Dr. Rani Bora. Dr. Bora is a qualified psychiatrist and mental health and resilience coach. She has studied a number of approaches to mental well-being, both traditional and non-traditional, and she focuses on holistic approaches to supporting people with their mental wellness. Since deepening her own understanding of the paradigm of innate health and resilience, she has committed herself to sharing this understanding in her coaching and training, and has witnessed remarkable transformation in individuals whom she has supported. In this interview, we discuss Dr. Bora's background in psychiatry, how she came to move away from more traditional psychiatric approaches, and the concept of innate health and resilience. Dr. Bora, thank you so much for talking with me today. I just wanted to start really by asking you about your own background and what it was that led you towards psychiatry. Um, Thank you, James. I am originally from India, and I um, graduated from medical school in 1997. And then I decided uh, I did various um, different um, placements in um, different medical areas, and uh, I got attracted to a psychiatry uh, because I always wanted to listen to people. I wanted to spend time with people, connect to people, and this is w- uh, why when the opportunity came up uh, for me to do post graduation in psychiatry, I took it up, and that was back in India. And then um, twenty uh, two thousand and one. I came to the UK and I um, continued my um, post-graduation in psychiatry. And um, back in 2011, um, I worked as a rehabilitation psychiatrist uh, and had uh, community patients and also uh, an inpatient unit. And I just wondered, Rani, what the differences were between working as a psychiatrist in India compared to the UK? Well, back then it was quite very different. I don't know if uh, if there has been some advances now, uh, possibly some advances. I didn't complete my whole post graduation there. I just did a few months before I decided uh, I don't want to uh, don't want to do my whole graduation uh, post graduation here and then go to UK. I might as well uh, come to the UK uh, because my husband was already here. Um, so what um, what I found interesting was that there was no uh, community um, services out there, where, at least where I worked. Uh, so it was only, uh, um, it, it was, uh, sorry, it was uh, outpatient clinics and there was a um, hospital setting, but there were no community outreach. There were no CPNs or doctors who went out in the community. And Rani, from looking at your material online at ranibora.com, you've clearly moved on from a more traditional view of psychiatric intervention. And in particular, I was interested in the principle of innate health and resilience. And I wondered how you first came across that concept. Okay, uh, James, what happened is uh, after I came to the UK, I I got curious about um, self-help and personal development. And what uh, drove me towards self-help is... um, I, I'll be very honest. As a child, I, I was quite insecure. There was nothing major. Um, I had a good life and good education, but I still had low self-esteem. And uh, I wanted to find out something that I could use in my own life and that then I could take to my patients at work. So this is how I started a journey of uh, going to different courses and uh, personal development courses. And then I decided, why don't I train to be a life coach? So uh, um, so parallel to my psychiatric training as a junior doctor, I also spent time and money investing in my own personal development. And I had lots and lots of different um, tools and techniques that I, I trained in, uh, to name a few, life coaching, uh, narrative coaching, NLP or neuro linguistic programming, EFT or emotional freedom techniques. And I was always looking, I always constantly looked because I thought, hang on a minute, if I know this works in my own life and helps me with my own insecurities or help me cope with life or make me a better person, let me try that. So it was almost like a search um, to be a better version of myself uh, until I finally came across this understanding and um, I had some massive, massive realizations, and I just stopped looking. Um, it just, uh, I just had a, this, this realization that who I was was enough, that uh, I was constantly looking, thinking there was something, something that, that was missing in me and also perhaps in other people, and actually I was looking in the wrong place. 
So that was my journey into coming across across this understanding. And, and what fascinates me about this understanding is, unlike the, all the tools and techniques I have learned along the way, where basically I'm say, we're saying that how you are at this moment is not good or it shouldn't be like this so uh, let me let us help and fix this so that you you feel better and, and although that's that sort of quick fix might be absolutely necessary when people are in acute crisis the danger of only uh, relying on tools and techniques is that um, once we stop doing those tools and techniques we feel rubbish again mm. and I think oh my goodness there's something wrong with me so when I came across this understanding and for the first time ever it was, it was very different. It was not something to do. It was an education. It was, a, 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 it was about understanding how every human being works, about how the mind works, and how we all have, uh, you know, we get caught up in our thinking and we really end up believing our thinking and how uh, after some time that passes away. So this is called innate health. And I, I, I definitely call it innate health and innate resilience. Some people call it the three principles. And I, I, I stay away from the three principles because it's, it becomes a jargon. People then ask me, well, what are the three principles? But for people to know that basically what this education or what this understanding is pointing people to is that people, irrespective of what diagnosis they have or what culture they might be from, or what the background is, we all have health, we all have well-being deep within us, and we also have resilience and that we, we get to experience from time to time. And resilience uh, is not that that comes from the outside. Uh, and people say that oh, we feel resilient when you know things are going our way, or um, when you know I'm and I'm mentally fit and physically fit. What we are saying is that the resilience is more of a of a state of a, a, an experience that we just know it, it's there within us, and from that space. Um, we just get the answers. We just know what to do in life and when we have challenges and so on. I was really interested to read this, Rani, because it feels very different to me to a standard medical route that a psychiatrist might take and even different to more psychological approaches like behavioural therapy or mindfulness. Uh, yes, it is different, and I'll tell you why. Uh, mindfulness is a great uh, tool. Um but it is a tool, and people have to sit down and and uh, and practice mindfulness. And and and, and of of course there are variations, and people might do walking meditation, walking or walking mindfulness, and, and that's great. I mean, there are times I you know I'm I'm very happy to use tools. I also see medication as a tool. And uh, as you know, James, and you have uh, you have interviewed lots of people. Uh, medication has its downside. It might benefit. Uh, some people, but it definitely doesn't benefit everyone, and uh, there are also like side effects of medication. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it is a tool. We can't say that medication is going to cure someone's suffering, for example, or that it's going to change uh, their life situation. Uh, so I'm not saying that what I share and what other people like myself share is going to change people's situation. Absolutely not. But how how it helps to is really really sort of educating them about okay that's the situation and yeah they are you know everyone has challenges life is full of challenges actually you never know what happens however you know how we experience life is still coming to us via the power of thought and thought doesn't have to be our you know our enemy um, we can have lots of creative thoughts to just uh, ju just look at whatever situation we are in and have fresh thoughts about how we might handle it how we might handle our challenges that really strikes a chord with me, particularly about looking within yourself, because solutions to my own emotional difficulties have quite often been given to me as external things, like rely on medications and that you have a chronic illness. But the concept of looking within yourself for solutions, that's much more reliable long term, isn't it? Absolutely. And the thing is that people get lost when they say, what do you mean by looking within? And people see that as almost like um, 
uh, self-blame. Like, hang on a minute, if the problem is not out there and um, it's all within me, so am I to blame myself? And absolutely not. We are not saying that. But when people wake up to this understanding that, hang on a minute, they are much more resourceful than they think they are, and no matter what happened to them in the past or what, or no matter what the situation is, at any moment to time, they have the capacity to have... Um, new ideas. They have the capacity to um, to have uh, fresh thoughts about um, what they need to do next or who to contact that, that might be able, able to help them. Um, and they also have the capacity to, to heal. Um, we know about the placebo effect, don't we? We have heard about the placebo effect. Uh, sometimes we speak of the placebo effect as almost like it's, it's, it's not good. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's nothing or it's not a big deal. But actually, all the placebo effect is pointing pointing us to is that the mind is extremely powerful. The mind is powerful. The mind has a you know the, the sort of unique ways of healing. And so, how come in in, in studies and in um, uh, different RCTs, we know that with placebo controlled trials, even people with placebo seem to seem to get better. Not everyone, but some people. So there is there is this untapped uh, potential of the mind that we are not looking at. So, and when we know that every one of us, um, like I said, whether we had diagnosis or, you know, or whether we are a doctor or a patient, we are all human beings and we all experience life the same way. So we need to start looking at what makes us, what makes us, what's common between all of us rather than what makes us different. Do you see what I mean? I do. And again, Rani, I feel that's very different in approach to where I've been in the past, where I felt like my struggles with anxiety and depression have been quite isolating. But you're suggesting reaching out and getting engaged with community or socially based support. Absolutely. And and there's not, and uh, my mentor and uh, psychiatrist from the US, Dr. Bill Pettit, um, has has a you know has a quote that I absolutely love, and he says, uh, and, and it is this: um, diagnosis doesn't say who you are, who you are, but it indicates where where you are. So there's something about people might have all sorts of diagnoses um, from the ICD-10 or DSM-5, um, and but but all that means is in that in in the particular moment in time where they were given the diagnosis. You know, that's that's the symptoms that they had. We're pointing to the diagnosis, but that diagnosis can never, they never mean the real person. So when we see the commonality in all human beings, irrespective of diagnosis at any given moment in time, we feel more connected. If I, as a professional, have this understanding, and I know that I might not have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, unlike. Uh, unlike my patients who might have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but there is something in common, which is I too get caught up in my thinking. I too have fixed beliefs. Uh, I, people might not call my beliefs delusional um, uh, because because it that doesn't seem very unusual. But I too get caught up in my thinking, and I think it's real. And then sometimes I I justify uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing, and, and unless I I see that. Uh, there might be this division, or unless I, I and other people see this, there might be this division in society, like, oh, people with depression are different, people with anxiety are different, people with any mental illness or chronic mental suffering are different. But you know what? We really need to look at the humanness of all of us. What is it that, you know, that, uh, that is common in all of us? And there won't be division, there won't be isolation. And people will realize, you know, it, a compassion, we don't have to, um, think that uh, we have to act compassionately, it will just come. When we just see beyond the labels, beyond the diagnosis, beyond people's presentation, that we are all in this together. That is such a refreshing and inclusive way of looking at this. And again, Rani, on your website, I came across a quote which I loved, which is, you can't fail at being yourself. And I found that such an empowering statement. <laughs> Because you, you know what, everyone, you know, we are all the same and yet we are all different at, at, at a sort of at, at one level. Uh, we all have our own uh, unique journey. Um, you know, we all have a timeline, things happen to us and we grew up somewhere and all, all, all those stuff. And, and sort of, um, 
you know, when we just focus on that, it seems like uh, we need to be like the other person or we need to be a better version of ourselves. And, and, and we keep failing because, you know what, if we compare ourselves with the next person who we, we idealize and we think, oh, I should be better off and, or, or look, that person had depression and, and, and look, they said where they are now. How come I can't get over this? Can, can you see how we get uncomfortable and we have more thinking around how we should rather be? And when we realize that there's no perfect human being on us, we all have our flaws, we all have our weaknesses, and to embrace that and to know that we are where we are and not to judge it, but realize that at any moment in time, we too can change. But we don't have to take someone else's journey and say, that's the, that's the blueprint for my life. Someone's blueprint is their blueprint. We could create our own blueprint. And actually, we are. We are doing it you know, unconsciously. But if people just realize and acknowledge that, you know, they cannot fail at being themselves and embrace themselves with their, you know, uh, mannerisms, with their accents such, such as my, my, you know, I, I just needed to go beyond just, uh, having the perfect English accent because I'm in the U. I just needed to be okay with my not being okay with my accent and people struggling to understand me um, with my all my uh, other shortcomings and realize that yes I could even I, I could really focus on those or I could step back and realize that th- those are what makes me um, unique. I, I you know I could just be okay with it rather than judge myself constantly like why am I like this? Why can't I do that better? And, and once uh, once I stop doing that. I just become more and more comfortable in my own skin. I just show up in life as me. And you know what? When there's less pretense, when there's less um, facade, how we present in society, and, and we show ourselves as vulnerable even, people just connect to us. People just know that there's another human being and we, and we feel that connection. That's so important, isn't it? And thank you for explaining that. And Rani, we live in a society where mental ill health is more recognised now and there is less stigma than there once was. But most people, when challenged, will admit that we still have a great deal of difficulty improving the lives of people labelled mentally ill, certainly via traditional means of treatment. And I just wondered what your thoughts were about what we should do as a society to change that. Well, um, James, and this is my opinion, I think we are um, focusing a lot on what's lacking in people. So say, for example, people get diagnosed with mental illness and with the best of intentions, because we really want to help people, um, we are looking at fixing. We are looking at fixing symptoms. We are looking at fixing the way people are, uh, are experiencing life. And we just want, want to sort of change that for, uh, for people. What then we are failing to look at? is people's innate resilience. We are f- failing to look at people's strength. Of course, don't get, don't get me wrong, people are trying to do that. It's almost like we are looking at external things um, to make us, uh, make us better. Like, for example, if this person has a job, then they will feel resilient or they'll, then we'll empower them. All, those, all of those are really needed. So I worked as a rehab psychiatrist and I was um, into, uh, I help people uh, start to build up a life and um, apply for jobs and and sort of get on with uh, having meaningful activities. But then what uh, what we then spend time doing is we do. We are are placing more more emphasis on people doing stuff, doing things so that they can be better or they can recover. Those are important, but then if people do not understand about their own resilience, their own capacity to have creative creative ideas and start afresh, and um, just because they are having, um, they have been depressed for like 10 years, doesn't mean that they can't, that they will need another 10 years um, to get better. It could happen, uh, it could happen very quickly once people have a realization about this innate health I'm talking about. So going back to your question, um, I really think we need to change. We, the, the paradigm has been looking at uh, illness. So when you, when people say mental health, actually we are talking mental illness. And like uh, Dr. Pettit said, uh, he said he had been to several lectures on mental illness, but not one lecture on mental health. 
And this is a psychiatrist with over 40 uh, years of experience. And I, I agree. Um, in my in my whole training, I have been to lots and lots of lectures of mental illness and, and, and treating mental illness and assessing people and risk assessment and management and so on. I have not been to uh, sessions uh, teaching me about mental wellness. This is something I came across pure by accident, given my interest in personal development and the self-help world. So can you see that people, uh, I, I really do believe that health professionals are really trying to do their best, given the knowledge and understanding, but this is missing. And because it's missing, we are not being able to teach people that come to us for help. It's clearly a very different approach that's needed, isn't it? And Rani, we're living in times where the response to mental health difficulties is quite rooted in medication and medical interventions. And I just wondered how you approach working with a client who is very invested in the medical approach to mental health care. And I can, uh, I can uh, clearly say that uh, I can also practice as a psychiatrist and, and show people this understanding or share with people this understanding. So I absolutely agree with you, and, and that's very innocent on the part of the person because what happens if someone has some sort of problem or they have been diagnosed, they would go and research it, and everywhere it's you know the, the sort of the, all the information out there is focused on a very medical model, uh, or there to, may, maybe too many information, and people might be caught up in they don't know what to do, and surely the experts know best, so they are coming from the place like, or oh, if the expert is telling me this is what works, I have to I have to believe it, and, and my question would be. That's great if they think this is really working. If it is working for them, so be it. So if, if people are saying, oh, I believe in a medical model and I want medication, if the medication works for them, that's great. Of course, we need to educate people about medication. And, and James, your podcast has done a fantastic job of really bringing in both um, experts by experience and experts, uh, professional experts, so people can uh, listen to the podcast and make up their own mind. And if it works for people and people are really living meaningful life, I have no problem. But if people are saying that, okay, I, I believe in a, mod a medical model, but nothing seems to be shifting for them, then I'll be, be curious about uh, what is the outcome they're looking for in life. And sometimes people, it might be fear. Uh, it might be fear-based. People might think, oh, they might be worried about um, sort of hurting uh, or uh, sort of upsetting someone by not following the medical model. See, uh, psychiatry can never be about health professionals. Even psychology can never be about psychologists. We are here to serve people. And the co one question we all need to ask is, uh, what is the outcome the person needs? And we, if we go back to that simple question, and we ask the simple question to the person, what is it that you're really looking for? If they say something like, I really want to be happy in life, or I need to be content, I want to be able to switch off, my, switch off from my overthinking, um, then sort of medication is not going to be the, you know, the long-term answer. It might be a, a short-term answer, and it might be really important, but we know that it's not a long-term answer. To me, it's the education about how the mind works and in innate health and resilience is, is the answer, and that's me. Also, Rani, I was interested in your thoughts on where you feel that psychiatry should move to to be able to provide the greatest benefit to those who struggle with their mental health. Yes, I, I do think um, we, we um, in terms of research, there's a lot of research in the causality and the treatment of mental illness, uh, and we are not uh, seem to be focusing on what makes people better, even those people who um, don't seem to take medications and have some sort of um, uh, mental 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 health issues. What makes them better? So, in other words, we we need to uh, sort of start looking in terms of research on the resilience of people. Um, we need to really look at educating people, and and so uh, so that people could could feel empowered rather than feel victimized that they are um, at the mercy of a, a mental illness or or the diagnosis, and that's it. Because can you see how people can lose hope? So, so um, for me, empowering people is the key. And I know already that there are recovery colleges set up and um, uh, peer, peer um, groups set up. And 
it would be fantastic in my view if the uh, if the peers who have gone through from one end and they have recovered they have survived it and to, uh, and they are telling the story and sharing the story to really understand what was the variable and what was the, what was the, the the common thing in all of their um sort of um uh, recovery what really helped so if they were to uh, to look deep, they would know that actually it was something that uh, that that stirred up in them, within them. Mm. So in other words, it was their innate resilience showing up, and then sort of they had the recover, they had the moment, and they had uh, had recovered from the mental illness. So that's one thing I wanted to raise. Uh, we talk a lot about um, prevention. For me, the earliest uh, earliest time ever is you know. This needs to be out in the community, so people could be healthy um, or seemingly ha- healthy. It, it's almost like it needs to be out there, where right, in the media about how um, we all have resilience and uh, we all go through setbacks. And and there's actually really no difference between someone who has been diagnosed with mental illness and how they think and co- get get caught up in their thinking and how we seemingly healthy people also experience a life and how we get caught up in our thinking so there is that's the thing people need to look at um the other thing is the health of the helpers Mm -hmm. In, in, in psychiatry um and I, I, I have known um, colleagues and uh, CPNs and support workers really struggling uh, with the stress and burden of uh, delivering a service. So here's the thing: if you don't have or if you don't feel or experience well-being in yourself, how can you be in a space where you are teaching people about well-being? So focus also needs to be how people, how the health professions can wake up to their own innate resilience can to see how they function and, and where their creative ideas come from so that then in turn they can share that, um, share that with people they serve. And you know what? Because of the lack of resources, um, this this would be perfect fit to what's the, the crisis out there. You know, I'm not talking about something you know very very complex. I'm talking about a simple understanding that can really help us first of all as health practitioners, health professionals, and then there's something we just share with people because it, it is common sense in a way. It is. And again, Rani, I'm so grateful to you for being a cheerleader for that different approach. And you're right, the health and well-being of the people involved in the care of others needs urgent attention too. Also, when you were talking about innate health and resilience, Rani, it made me think about those examples where a number of people have been exposed to the same trauma and yet have very different reactions. Maybe one person can put it behind them and another may obsess over it and become quite unwell in response. But what we tend to do is focus on the person that was unwell rather than learn from the person that displayed resilience. We focus on an illness model, don't we? Every, so going back to your example, every single person in that, in that scenario would still be using the power of thought but having a different experience. So one per- a person could be able to move on to it because you know, they just know that uh, for whatever reason, they just uh, sort of are able to sort of um, perhaps have a different thought about it or have a different perspective about it. But someone else could really feel gutted and, and sort of have memories and flashbacks about uh, that. But even the flashbacks and the memories that a person might have about an event is still coming via, via the power of thought. And we are not saying that that didn't happen. And when, in, when it happened, it might, must have been extremely terrifying uh, for the person. But if the person realizes that at the moment, at this moment in time, they, that's not happening. That happened then. And this is the illusionary power of the mind. So when they realize that they don't have to be scared of their experiences, that's, that's an illusion created by the mind. You know what? They just can shift. They can just have a, have a relax and they know that they, they are not broken despite what happened. That's really important, isn't it? And Rani, I just wondered if there was anything else that you felt is important to discuss. I think there's one final thing I would like to say and I would really um, want people to reflect on this. And, and it, this is, it, 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 it is that um, people are not broken. Mm-hmm. And I really want people to reflect on this because it seems like sometimes given what happened in the past or given what people said or given situations uh, people uh, 
believe that they are broken and it, it is not true. Uh, also, when people are given a diagnosis of some sort of mental illness um, and, and they just might have this, that they are somehow broken and that's absolutely not, not true. And what I mean by that is something at the core. There's something at the core of who we are that cannot be touched by the past, by other people, by circumstances, no, no matter how terrifying or terrible they have been. And once people wake up to the truth of this, they will they will know that they are enough. They will know that you know who they are is 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 good enough. And actually, also they will be able to really listen to their own um, to their to their own wisdom more and more, to their common sense more and more, more and more. And they will find that they are more resourceful than they ever thought they were. And I really want to people to know this because when we talk about hope and healing, hope can never come from outside. People get, can give you hopeful messages, but unless you know this to be true at some level, not not at, from an intellectual point, you can't think this. This is this is a realization. But once you once you realize this as a truth, that at a very deep core level, you are not broken. You can never be broken, and you know some things will shift. So I just want you to reflect on this and, and see if it. See if it seems true, but I know it has helped lots of people when they have this understanding that they are not broken. That's a very empowering and important message to give. Thank you. You're so welcome, James. I'm so thankful to you too. Um, first of all, for what you're doing, I- I've been pointing more and more people to your podcast, and um, thank you so much, Ronnie. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me for the podcast. It was a really fascinating discussion. I'm so grateful to Rani for taking the time to chat with me today. And if you want to find out more about Rani and her work, you can visit her website, ranibora.com. That's R-A-N-I-B-O-R-A dot com. Madden America News and Updates. On Madden America, we wanted to let you know that on September the 12th, family therapist Marilyn Wedge and psychologist Gretchen Lefevre Watson will present an MIA continuing education webinar on non-drug interventions for youth diagnosed with ADHD. Dr. Gretchen Lefevre Watson and Dr. Marilyn Wedge will show research that contradicts the mainstream conceptualization and treatment of ADHD in the United States and offer alternatives to psychiatric drugs for effectively resolving challenging behaviors at school and home. The webinar will be held on September 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Time, and 5 p.m. British Summer Time. The webinar will last for approximately 90 minutes and registration is $20. This course is designed to educate mental health professionals as well as the general public. To find out more and to register, visit maddenamerica.com and use the link at the top right-hand side of the homepage. So thank you for listening today, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.